Hello everyone, I'm Grandmaster Dennis Brosh, and this is a game between Magnus Carlsen and the challenger Jan Nepomniachtchi, and this is a game six, which actually lasted about seven hours and a record breaking 136 moves. So for that very reason, we are just going to focus at the most critical parts of the game. So do bear with me, there'll be some exciting moments here. Now, first, of course, the opening choice by Magnus. Magnus decides to go and play this G3 line. Actually, I have played it myself. It's very interesting. White is basically playing a Grunfeld setup with an extra tempo. Now, Nepomniachtchi have plenty of options here, getting a symmetrical Grunfeld, or just to keep on to the game plan of playing the same old lines and trying to hold it all together. Ship G2, Ship E7, Castles, Castles, B3, which is such a rare move in this position. And it's actually very interesting, people were talking about why is this so unique? Well, most of the time, Black does not stick to his gun and go for bishop e7 castles, but tries to stop this c4 plan with b7 to b5 and control the c4 square. Going for the main line is much more rare than in you would expect it to be. Now, there is an important game, and it is namely the game between the Hungarian Super Grandmaster Zoltan Ribli versus the champion Anatoly Karpov, which goes c4, takes queen c2, takes bishop f4, going after the pawn, takes here, takes, takes, and all these moves are somewhat irrelevant apart from the ending, which Ribley was aiming for and eventually won against the legendary Anatoly Karpov. Here, even though White has some weaknesses there, they're very well defended by the king and that e-pawn. And after knight d3, black has weaknesses on the queen side, which was enough in that game for a white victory. And this is a game very much important and relevant to the game at hand. So in this game, Carlson came up with this newish move of b3, c5, c4, queen c2. And what white is arguing that black has no development at all, while white is ready to take as much space and control over the middle as he could possibly get while black is trying to develop. Queen e7, knight d2, basically an invitation for a pawn sacrifice, which is actually uh, just rejected by Nepomniachtchi. If you take knight takes, bishop d6, knight d4, Yes, black gets the extra pawn, but there is at least one, two, and three move till that rook can get out. And if you go e5, there is knight b5, and there is very, very big pressure on that d6 bishop. So if you go knight c6, there is rook d1. If you move the bishop, already bishop a3, and not only you did not manage to develop at all, you are also getting skewered by the a3 monstrous bishop. So for that very reason, Nepomniachtchi goes for knight c6, knight takes c4, and b5. So the fight is sort of revolving around developing for black and getting cruise control in the middle as white. b5 is a very good move, not fearing the power of this bishop and also hoping to activate a bishop which is really bad in these type of structures. Knight e5, knight b4, again winning time, bringing that bishop out, queen b2, a3, knight c6, knight d3. Very similar concept from that game in the 1980s between Ribley and Karpov. This knight is actually majestic on that square, controlling the e5, pestering that bishop, and over defending the king. Bishop b6, bishop g5, kind of scooting closer to that endgame that we've mentioned before. Rook d8, bishop takes f6, and Nepomniachtchi. Not sure if he was actually in the know of that game, but instinctively declines that. Of course, if you trade, you could easily end up in a similar endgame where white is attempting to trade off the b7 bishop and just bank on the strong knight and weak pawn plan. So g takes f6, which is a great move. 
black is keeping the queen on the board while this queen on b2 is somewhat snuffed because it really can't get too active rook c1 knight d4 trades trades and this is kind of like that position however with a big difference that black is going to be able to activate the queen while this counterpart on a2 isn't looking shabby king g1 queen e4 queen c2 activating it so notice that Carlson is doing his utmost to make sure that his pieces are as active as they can be. a5, rook d1, rook c8. And here actually commentators were suggesting e3, but that would sort of loosen that knight, which was such a monster over there. And it, there is a potential that it's going to be driven away. For that very reason, Carlson play, plays off Anderson style over defending everything and making and hoping that everything's going to be all right rook c8 a very good practical choice by nepomniachi however the strategical dangers i think he underestimated takes takes queen d5 trying to go for those pawns a4 fixing that weakness e3 h4 creating a bit of a loft for the king king h2 bishop b2 well when it comes down to tactics nepomniachi is a very strong player here, Carlson played rook c5, queen d6, and rook d1, which turns out to be inaccurate. Rook c2 would have been the brilliant move, but what is really brilliant is to realize that you can give up both of those pawns because white's activity, in fact, will be not just good for an initiative, but is near winning. But seeing this in time trouble is very difficult, and Carlsen honestly is not the type of player to sacrifice for a compensation or not in this decade. So he goes for rook d1, takes, and admittedly by Carlsen, he misses this very nice move of queen d7. And in general, I think Carlsen's a logical thinker. He may have thought of queen c6 trying to go to c2, but then he can block it and the rook is in time to get out of trouble. However, queen d7 is illogical because it actually forces that rook to go to a better square. However, there is no better square for the rook. If you go here, there's queen c7, and then you lose to queen c2. because You either lose the rook or the knight. And if you move the rook, then these pieces are still a bit loose. And here, Nepomniachi makes a mistake that is somewhat uh, peculiar. He goes for e5. Instead of the move bishop takes b4, because you of course can't take it, you lose the rook. And if you move the rook away, bishop e7, you are going to see a game where it is a black who is pressing, even though it's not necessarily a guarantee yet that it's a victory for black. However, I do presume that Nepo, excited by the fact that Cousins in big time trouble, goes for the complicating move of e5, e4, However, this quickly backfires. Rook c2, trying again to over defend. If you go here, there's knight b2 and that rook is defended. Queen d5, queen b3, e4, and knight takes e4. And this was a crucial moment where I felt that already the tables had turned. White is slightly bit better and black has to be extremely accurate. Queen b3. And then now the knight actually is hopping towards the h5 pawn. And even though black has enough play, but there's too many weaknesses for black to really claim equality. In a5, blocking it. They're moving around and about, getting the infamous knight moves in, as Andrea Botes requested it. King h7, queen e4, and rook takes a3. A very, very nice little sacrifice saying that even if you take, which Napo didn't do, White will eventually be able to jump around the horse and go pick up the h-pawn with very good winning chances. So Napo Miyachi decides to actually take on h4, go queen a4, knight e2, rook a2, king g2, f3. And even though the position seems to be around close to equal, but there's just too many weaknesses and the king is loose. And that's actually the reason I'm always telling people, defend your king, have them guardian pawns in front of it. D1, king f2, and Carlsen now starts playing like a true machine. 
he is gonna make sure that there is no breakthrough for Napomniachi. Bishop b6, rook a1. First, he clears off any of queen threats on the first rank. Queen b3, rook e4. Note how he is over defending everything in his path and then he moves on forward. Rook e8, rook a8, rook c8, rook c1. Again, more of restricting than actually going for a clear plan. Bishop b6, rook e8, rook c1, queen d5, repeating a bit, but in reality, Carlsen is sort of like the milkman. If there's any bit of milk left, he is going to push. Rook b1 and probing for that bishop. Rook e7, rook b7, rook b5, bishop b6, takes, rook takes f7, and this is the huge turning point because now the position is drawish, but only according to computers. And human defense with a blitz portion is near impossible. So here, Carlsen goes and moves around, but again, makes sure that Nepo never really has enough counterplay. Rook d1, rook d2, rook e2, kind of threatening e4, but then deciding not to play it yet. Checks, checks, knight f3, again moving a little bit forward. Checks, checks, knight d4, plenty of knight moves as per request. Check, knight f3, rook d2, queen b1, Rook d1 just wasting time and may making a little bit of progress. And after knight e2, queen b1, e4, best by test, and it's time to move those pawns. Also, side note, if white wouldn't have pushed the pawn, then there would be a 50 move rule very shortly. Now, the position is objectively drawn, but it's very difficult to defend. Takes, rook f3, the king is walking about. And as soon as that pawn is marching to the sixth, it was game over. Of course, you can't take that rook because knight g7 check. Queen g6, rook f7, another stylish move by Carlsen. If you take this check and you lose the ensuing endgame, because of course the opposition, this is theoretically won. And after king d8, f5, knight g7, white won. So I really hope you enjoyed this little breakdown of this important game of game six. Let me know in the comments and do subscribe if you enjoyed this little breakdown. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.